Hello again, it's David Willey, the curator of the Tank Museum, here uh, in an exciting new setting in the back garden against the, uh, the hedge and the washing line behind me. Um, and I'm the curator, not at the Tank Museum at the moment because it is still closed, but the good news is it does look like we're going to be opening in fairly early in July. And what I would say is, again, if you're keen on coming, uh, when we do open again, do have a look on our website. Now, I'm filming this later on in the afternoon, which is why I've moved the camera position. Um, this last weekend, we had our online event with World of Tanks, a sort of kind of online tank fest with contributions from some or other fellow European museums. I'm filming this before that event took place. So, uh, so if I refer back to or forward to or whatever and get slightly confused in all these things, uh, bear with us as ever. And, um, and the format, what normally happens here is that people have sent in questions via either in the comments section or by email and other ways that way, and I try and answer some of them. And at the same time, those of you who are used to all this, you, you understand the issues, um, I'm trying to flog you or encourage you to buy things from our online shop, which has been open throughout the whole museum closure. And that is our only source of income at the moment. We are an independent charity. I know some of you are new to this. Most of you have watched some of these before. So that's why we're trying to do that, encouraging you to buy something and that helps the, uh, the museum keep going in these difficult times. So let's get on with some questions again. And uh, let's start off with, I'm going to start back to a question that I, um, I didn't answer before, I kept missing it. Um, but Philip Elliston asked the question about the Berg Panther. And he said, because when the panther famously, when it comes out, has a lot of teething troubles, transmission issues, etc., did they do something to the Berg Panther's transmission? Because presumably, if it was going to be towing another tank, it's going to put even more pressure on that transmission. So what do they do about that? Well, having looked this up, um, much to my surprise as well, they don't actually really change anything about the Berg Panther's transmission. Um, and when you read how the Berg Panther is supposed to be used, yes, they do talk about towing other vehicles, but officially, when you read the literature, what you're supposed to do with a broken down tank on the battlefield is you're supposed to winch that tank. You put down on the Berg Panther, the rear anchor, into the ground, you use your winch, you winch that tank you are recovering to where the Berg Panther is, stop, reposition the Berg Panther, put the, winch, the uh, spade down again, use the winch again, re-winch and sit till you get to, you carry on doing that till you get to a place of safety as they say, uh, where therefore you can either work on the knocked out or broken down tank um, or arrange a tow. Um, now whether that's back to two, three, eight ton half tracks, inevitably in the photographs you see they are using the Berg Panther to tow a tank along. Um, so, you know, whether you just try to use a winch where the angles are a bit steeper or something or other and get the advantage from the winch that way. Um, but they don't actually officially do anything to the transmission to change all that. So again, and I think again, like a lot of, if you read about the Panther, those early problems with transmission and later one of the other suppositions that's coming out a little bit more is actually it's again, it's another one of those vehicles where you need a skilled driver. So sometimes it's an unskilled driver that's making more of a problem of the transmission than perhaps there really was. Um, and of course, as we've mentioned before, later in the war, the Germans are running out of those skilled crewmen, even though they've got a very sophisticated bit of kit that needs a skilled crewman to drive it, such as a Panther. So I hope that answers that one. Um, let's move on to some other questions. Uh, just Ian made the point, you know, I just sort of said about the SDKFZ system as if you all knew about that. Absolutely right. Why not bring that up? Because this assumption we've all got great interest in the same sorts of things all the time and everything. But we're at, sometimes our interest levels are at different um, stages in that. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we haven't even got there yet. But what is the SDKFZ system? Um, so SDKFZ is a German wartime numbering system for what the Germans call spe special purpose vehicles. So they tend to be armoured vehicles, etc. So it's the German ordnance offices, etc. It's how they're defining each different category. And SDKFZ actually uh, stands for, and forgive my German uh, attempt here, Sonderkrafts Fahrzeug is the actual long word, abbreviated to SDKFZ. 
and uh, what happens is then every sort of category is given a, a range of about 100 vehicles so 1 to 99 is unarmoured half tracks 100 to 199 are tanks 200 to 299 is recce's apc and command tanks 300 onwards tend to be mine um, clearance or demolition vehicles and within that each kind of vehicle is given an sdk of said number but that idea of those categories sometimes they sort of stray outside them um, and that tends to be the unique identifier of that type of vehicle and so when a new one comes along they tend to give a new sdk of said number unique number to it so that's that system so when you see it always written afterwards sdk of said and then a number hopefully you'll now know what that numbering means um right let's carry on uh, John S said he started his comment with he went to the tank museum for his honeymoon and you kind of start thinking what a lucky girl eh um, but it turns out it was his new wife who suggested the trip to the tank museum so lucky boy John S and thank you for your nice kind comments about the tank museum um, why not adventures um, he asked the question how in World War One were the tank battalions organized um, this is like another one of these things, whatever moment you tend to go to, it it's, can change. But at the very beginning, at the Battle of Fleur, Corselet, where the first tanks go out there to be used, a couple of battalions worth, they are organised with 24 tanks per battalion, one in reserve, and that battalion, or at the time, there's, they're cut up into sections of four tanks or sorry four sections of six tanks each that's how they were used at that very first tank attack that was the, the, the basis behind them and two end battalions go out there to be used on that first one if we cut forward to the time of the battle of Combray, the tank battalions um, that are being used out there they are now uh, broken down into companies and there's four sections of three tanks in each company. So again, tends to be each tank, by the way, is commanded by a lieutenant, major will command the company. Um, so you've got 12 in each company and uh, some of the sections, even at Combray, they're still using a system. So there was kind of like an intermediate one where they had three sections of four tanks. So some of them are still doing that as a, as a way of organizing um, their different battalions. And uh, for those three companies that you normally have in a battalion, so that would make up 36 tanks, um, and normally those companies A, B and C within that battalion, six tanks are kept in reserve, two tanks are used uh, as supply tanks for bringing ammunition forward, and there was four tanks integral to each tank battalion for the attack, four tanks as wire pullers, so that would make you about 48 tanks in each battalion so you can see how this changes and the battalion tends to be how you identify with and those battalions the numbers grow within the first world war and they all come under um burma corps where the tank corps headquarters are and they're chopped and changed into different um larger units during the course of depending on what battle they're going for and what how they're being used at the time so i hope that gives you a little bit on that one um, how the tanks were used um, Bill Ronan asks what colour, and forgive me a second, I'm going to take a slurp here. It's now the end of the afternoon, so I'm allowed to slurp as dead fly in the damn thing already. Actually, he's not dead yet, he might survive. Um, so, yes, chin chin, sorry, it's the end of the afternoon, as I did mention here, instead of tea as usual. Bill Ronan asks what colour would a Stug Commander's uniform be? We've mentioned this before. If you go back to, um, if you're looking at Sturmgeschutzes, originally they are commissioned um, by Manstein for the Sturm artillery to support the infantry. They're separate from the Panzer arm that's going forward under Guderian. And of course, this slightly merges and changes during the Second World War and as the war goes on. But early days, if you're painting a a stood commander early days if it's a model or something or other what would color with the jacket they'd be wearing they looked at in 1936 the panzer wrap jacket um, issued to the panzer troops they like it 
but because the Sturm artillery was supposed to be supporting the infantry in the attack, a black uniform they thought would stand out too much, so they end up making their uniforms in the classic same woolen material, the grey, grey-green colour of the standard German infantryman. And so that, you, that jacket, even though it's the same design as the 1936 Panzer uniform, it's actually done in the standard grey-green um, that you're used to seeing on the infantry. So that's what the chap will be wearing, certainly earlier in the war. And again, that jacket ends up getting issued to other troops later in the war, so it's not unique to the Sturm artillery. And as the war progresses, if you look at all the photographs, they end up wearing all sorts of things under the sun. So, uh, but early in the war, that's what the colour of the jacket would have been. Um, and no piping around the edge, even though one or two privately purchased jackets do seem to have it. They didn't do it like the, uh, uh, the tank crews having a coloured piping, pink for the Panzer Wharf, etc. Um, right, let's carry on going. The Breaking Potato asks the question about the E100. Do we have any records of it? Because, um, as everybody says, it comes to the Tank Museum and gets scrapped. Um, an interesting one. I've looked into this one before. E100 is captured out in Germany, as in it's uh, the hull is there. Um, this, what was going to be the super heavy German tank next generation, had been worked on. Um, it is low loaded, and there's photographs of it when it was captured. It's low loaded, there's pictures of it on the back of a low loader. It comes back to the UK and it goes up to the School of Tank Technology, which initially was up at Chobham and then the trail seems to go cold and this is where everybody always says well what did you do with it etc the intention there is a document i've seen it we have it in the archive which lists all the captured vehicles and interesting stuff that was at the school of tank technology when it was up at chobham and there is a line the intention was it to come down to bovington did it ever come to us? I can find no actual evidence as yet that the hull of E100 actually ended up at Bovington. Um, and that's one of these ones where if anybody out there, you know, um, there's the photograph so often, it, sometimes they're miscaptioned. There's the photographs when it was first picked up in Germany at that range where our King Tiger, um, the Jag Tiger was, etc. That has sometimes been mislabeled as being at Bovington, and it's wrong, it's not Bovington. Um, but, yes, photographic evidence of it being low loaded. I've seen no other photographic evidence as yet of it, even in the UK, even though this report says it was definitely at School of Tank Technology up at Chobham. Um, what happens next? We just, I haven't seen any evidence of that. So, did it make it to the Tank Museum? Is there any photographic evidence or report or something? I haven't seen it. Um, or was it actually, do we really want a low load of this empty hull, you know, and the cost and everything else, or was it scrapped there? We just don't know on that one. Um, but again, if you think you've seen more evidence or perhaps know where there might be some more evidence, be fascinated because it's another one of those, you know, so many people interested in those super heavy German tanks now, etc. What happened to that particular one? Uh, Nathan Young, he asked the question, will you be working with the new artillery museum that's opening next year? Sadly, Nathan, I really don't think that new artillery museum will be opening next year. It's just um, as we're talking, if you go on their website, sadly, they've lost um, from their point of view, their site um, that they were going to have up at Lark Hill. I think they're still keen to do that. Um, so watch this space when the uh, artillery get um, back together and get themselves a new museum going. Um, Ed Gracie. Um, Oh yes, now he mentions about the Ed Ray, uh, the Das Reich book and he's mentioned the question, he says, you know, are you sure you really want people to read that because you don't mention certain things? Yes, I do want people to read that for that very reason, what's in there, Ed, that you're mentioning. Um, why do we think we want people to read this subject and everything? It's learning the fuller picture. So um, I don't want to sound too cryptic, but read that Das Reich book and you'll understand what we're on about. Um, James Sutton asks a question. Um, do tanks fire grape shot style ammunition so back to you know when you uh, if you know about carronades um waterloo period cannons earlier later the idea of firing like a shotgun 
uh, lots and lots of pellets from a tank. Yes, canister shot. Amazingly, there is canister shot for the six pounder gun that was used in the very first tanks in the First World War. And the idea of canister shot is it basically, it's in a can or canister, uh, some type of holder, lots and lots of pellets. Um, on the end of a normal cartridge, it's blasted out and that tends to fly out and shred and it goes out in a, in a fairly wide pattern. So again, it tended to be used for things such as if you've literally got human wave attacks or lots of infantry that are firing at like a shotgun um, and the pellets can be quite large and cylindrical sometimes, different types of ones used. And we don't have one of those rounds at the Tank Museum, but I've seen a couple of them in uh, Philip gorzinski has got a couple at the Deborah Museum where they've dug out that beautiful tank out the ground um, out at Cambrai and he's got a couple of them there. So they were definitely used, I found references to being used in 1918 by tank crews. So they were there right in the First World War. They were used through, now different times, different periods, tanks have taken them, Centurion tanks had them in Korea and um, they were definitely used as canister rounds in Korea as well. I know they were used in Vietnam because they could also clear vegetation. If you've got any worries, what's behind that? Woof, this shreds everything out the way for you uh, if you fire a canister round. So again, there's an, uh, uh, a canister come, tends to come and go it's one of those ones, boy, is it useful to have kind of like in the uh, in the locker ready. Um, but at the chance of using it, maybe you hope pretty slim, but when you do need it, boy, you need canister. So yes, tanks are still around there with canister. And forgive me, I'm just going to throw the dog. Oh, I'm going to throw the ball rather, not the dog. Drop it, Finn. There we go. He's just had his tea. I thought he'd go to sleep. He's had a walk and um, I haven't had my tea yet, which is why well, I better get on with it. Um, right. So that's a great shot one that's going over. Um, Jacob Clark asks a question about why does the Mark 7 light tank, the Tetrarch, get overlooked when it seemed to be used so influential in certain things? The influential bit, it's quite often one of those ones like it's the first tank they end up putting the screen round, uh, Nicola Strausler, to test for a DD tank. Now the Tetrarch is one of these interesting ones because again, going back to oh, doing the stuff on tank production, back in 37, 38, light tanks were being ordered to keep the factories or get newer factories up to speed on making tanks, which is why we ended up with so many light 6B tanks. Whilst they were getting the newer designs ready, test cut your teeth on something simpler, it seems to be, like a light tank. And the Tech Trucks 3738 was one of those light tank series of the families that was you know, potentially going to go into service and everything else. The problem was Vickers at the time gets too busy. They become the parent body. They hand it over to Metropol Metropolitan Camel, who are now going to get into tank building. And Metropolitan Camel then have to wait a while because the Tetrarch has got some very sophisticated ideas on it. This way you steer by turning and it that bends the wheels, turns the wheels rather, bends the track to steer. Um, these were all quite clever things, but some of the ideas haven't necessarily got to maturity yet, including one of the basic ones, which was how do you keep the engine cool? And they had um, delays when they finally get round Metro Camel to, to, to actually start making them. They have a three month delay while they try and sort out the cooling system. And then what happens is bomb damage to the factory then delays production to the point that only a few are coming out, half a dozen, when there's been a fairly substantial order to the point that about a hundred ultimately get made and then the order is canned in uh, the beginning, I think it's March, it is, yeah, 42, they terminate the order. Um, so the Tetrarch is one of those weird ones where yes it's used in small numbers but its production history is things have moved on and it's only it's only ordered really in that we're, because we, we've almost given up on the light tank in Britain, um, but it's only carried on with Metro Camel because Churchill says, keep building what we're building in the factories rather than stopping anything. Um, we want quantity now rather than quality at the moment, etc., etc. You know, so so that was the reason it kept on there. So it's one of those awkward tanks that tends to, and you're right, it does get overlooked because of that. But it's so few of them um, end up being made. You know, about a hundred there. Uh, Marcus Wardle, uh, another question, or rather you can pick yourself off the floor again because your name's been mentioned. Um, Tom Meekin, you asked, um, I mentioned before, what I was really saying is if you put an extra millimetre of armour protection, in other words thickness, add that to a whole of a main battle tank, you've added another tonne in weight, if that's, that answers the question. I hope I've said that clearly enough, which is why every time we're doing this, when we keep saying about adding more armour, think of a person 
if you add 10%, 20% more weight to you as a person, add 20%, you're not going to be as fit, as agile, or whatever as you are. And same for a tank, which is why every time you're adding armour, your capacity is bound to go down in another area. Throw the ball again. Finn, where you put it? Oh, there it is, right. Um, so, so I hope that answers that one again. Um, AC asks about, I had that box out last time, didn't we, with models and the, uh, the painting. Normally, if you buy a model kit on its own, it doesn't come with the paint unless it's saying something special. So that's why I say that is all the other models you're going to buy in the shop, unless you buy that starter kit with everything together, you're not going to get them all there. Um, but do have a go, if, like I was saying last time, if you fancy having a go, the starter kit's a good way of going because everything's in it. Glue, you know, paints a lot ready for you to get going on it. Um, Pat, I'm going to say your name wrong again. I'm sorry, sorry about this. Petros Derizas, is it? Asks about, can I recommend a book about Canadian armour in the Second World War? Um, there's some good, bigger books, um, as ever. We'll talk about books again in a moment. All these costs about books and when to buy them and everything. There's a really good one called the Royal Canadian Armoured Corps, which is a real thick but great history of the whole of the Canadian Armoured Corps. I know you're particularly interested in World War II and European theatre. There's a lot of very good books on individual tanks and the weapon systems. Um, again, some of else out there might like to come back and say what's good on the Canadians in Northwest Europe or particularly Normandy. My gut feeling is you'll probably end up finding a lot of good information on those more general books. So, you know, things like John Buckley, British Armour in Normandy includes, you know, the Commonwealth Contribution, Polish Armour Division, etc. as well. So that might be the way of looking at those as well as a topic. But of those of you Canadians out there, if you've got particularly good ones to recommend about Canadian armour in Normandy, please do pop them up there so we can uh, answer that one for him. Um, Wesley Shirley, that was it. Did... Um, did the uh, British learn from naval armour in the First World War? Um, it's interesting, this one, because yes and no is a kind of answer, because yes, they were going to some of the same factories that were making armour plate for the navies, Beardmore's up in Scotland, etc. Um, but actually, the armour plate for a tank was so much thinner than the armour plate that tended to be going on ships at the time. So yes, there is a bit of crossover there and sometimes the same manufacturers, but um, tank armour was wittily thin compared to some of the stuff that was going on ships at the time and the hardening process, etc. It might have been the same, but actually there were very different uh, scales there. Uh, Rob Walford Water, oh yeah, sorry, Rob Walford, um, again, served in tanks evidently, and he comes back and talks about um, that issue when we said about the tanks leak and everything. And one of the points he makes that we sometimes overlook, um, when you're inside a tank and it's cold, your breath, uh, the condenses on the metal on the inside, and he he's, describes it like living in a cage. And that quite neatly takes me on to, sorry, there's a... Um, <laughs> Small world, I wish I could turn the camera up, but we got a couple of US Air Force, those clever planes with the uh, helicopters. They've been doing some exercises down here at Bovington and everything, flying over the ones that can actually angle their propellers and do that afterwards. Um, so I'm telling you all this if you're an airplane fan, but not showing you, but that was what was flying over. Um, yeah, so Rob Walford saying that about condensation, that reminds me because uh, I had the great privilege, I met Otto Carius, the famous Tiger commander. We had him one evening at the Tank Museum. Um, he was still working, the story behind it, he was still working as that uh, pharmacist out in Germany at his Tiger pharmacy. And uh, it was only because it was a bank holiday weekend in Germany, he had enough time to say goodbye to it, as it were, come over to Britain, give a talk, and he popped in at the Tank Museum, and we put him back in a Tiger. And uh, it was really interesting because very honest guy, very, very straightforward. And he told us a lot of little, lovely little anecdotes. And one of them, he told the story of when he was on guard duty on the Eastern Front, he was supposed to be on watch in the turret of his tiger. And he mentions the fact that your breath on the cold metal of the tank, um, when it went sub-zero, of course, all this condensation, you know, and they were talking about, you know, the sides of inside the turret running with condensation, that would freeze. And uh, he was honest enough to admit that what happened is he actually nodded off to sleep. He's supposed to be on watch. He nods forward 
and at some point, whether it was a noise or something or other, he suddenly realises he's fallen asleep, wakes up with a start, pulls his head back like that, not knowing his hair has actually ended up freezing in this moisture on the turret cupola, and he said he ripped a great big patch of hair out his scalp, stuck in this frozen on the edge of the turret there, as he woke up with a start, you know, and again, the usual thing, worried he's either going to get told off or suddenly the Russians are on him, or sort of thing. And um, anyway, anyway, he told us that story, and, it, uh, and again, these little details telling you, you know, this idea about, you know, obviously the inside of the tank, but this idea of it running with water. The other one I always remember him telling was that sense of the movement we see the tanks quite often, they're not fully stowed anymore, but they'd have these little canvas girt sacks with belts of ammunition. And he said that driving along with these, almost sort of moving, you know, in motion with the vehicle either side as they're hung on racks. And he came out with a number of those little things. There's a photograph of him actually in our Tiger Haynes manual, um, if you want that, where we put him back in the tank there. So that was an interesting one, I thought. Um, um, Crumbum2, um, uh, an American gentleman, asked a question, what does crackers mean? And it is funny, isn't it, where we all use the same word, so I think I said it's a cracker last time. Um, in Britain, a cracker is also a biscuit, um, as it is in America, I gather, um, but a cracker is a fine example of something. Um, so I don't think a lady's going to be too um, horrified if you say she's a bit of a cracker sort of thing. Um, it sounds a bit dated in some terms and everything, but it's another one of these words that's got so many different meanings, hasn't it, in different places. And I was, you know, we have a Christmas cracker. You pull it open, go snap, and there's a, you know, toy or some joke inside it and everything. Um, so it has multiple meanings, but cracker's good thing which is quite weird because when I look this up, I gather in certain states in America, a cracker is not a nice term. Um, so um, there we are, the great, great joys we're all having, isn't it, with these questions and answers about the English language. Um, so I think that comes to the end of the questions I was going to answer today. As ever, you know I'm going to try and, um, Finn, drop the ball. Um, and thank you as well, everybody um, says hello to Finn, so there's, uh, there's the ball again. Um, as ever, um, what, what can we sort of interest in? You know, if you watch the event that would have been last weekend um, and you're interested in the online stuff and the gaming stuff, World of Tanks, that's one of the ones we've got, 100 years of armoured warfare. Um, and I gather these are numbered copies. And I think, as I was saying last time, we've got some stuff in here about where they do, but it's all about the World of Tanks game. If you're interested in your online games, we've got another one on the uh, World of Tanks bit, which is called the Commander's Guide, um, which again is on our, so as I said last time, it is amazing, even though you play online games, you look at everything on the internet, people still like hard copy books to look at as well, don't they? Um, on that score, I know a lot of you have bought our tank book, um, but the nice thing is we've also not just got the floppy back version of the DK Dorling Kindersley nice tank book, which you've all been very kind to recommend, um, but we've also, if you're a transport person, we've also got the train and the car book as well, um, which are at superb prices, beautifully illustrated, if you want to have a look at those ones as well. Um, I constantly bring you back to, if you're interested in a subject, try one of these ones. We've got them at really good knockdown prices. Haynes Manuals, we've been helping publish on tanks and quite a number of them. This one, the Centurion, there we go, £8.99. I know they vary in prices we've got on there. T-34 tank one at eight ninety nine, and there's a Panther tank one there at eight ninety nine. And if you go back to see, I always say this, you know, look at other people's comments, they recommend them as well. It's not me just trying to sort of land them on you. I think they are really good value and lots of good information if you like this subject. Um, there's other ones we've managed to pick up nice and cheaply. I, was, I showed you some last time. Do have a look if you've got the chance. There's some really good ones there. $2.99, all about the Jewish soldiers that uh, went back to fight the Nazis. Um, again, $2.99, some of these things. Michael Scott, this, he did this book on um, this guy, Peter Juan Tetley. Um, you read some of these guys' life stories and they're like, you know, Biggles, boys, own heroes, all rolled into one. He ends up, you know, colonial administrator and everything afterwards, but it's all his um, fighting as a commando. He's in the SAS, SOE, and he's a paratrooper in the Second World War, £2.99. You know, you can't really go wrong with those ones. And I would say, again, if you're a First World War buff, this one we've got, um, all on basically the beginning of, as he says there, trench warfare, 1915. 
um, by Paul Kendall. It is beautifully researched and illustrated. You won't be able to see all this, but great thick, weighty tome. And um, I can't remember, 25 pound book, and I can't, you know, the life it hasn't got a sticker on it. I think this is under a fiver at the moment, but you know, again, there's some really, really good books there. Have a look. Um, and you can always look them up on Amazon you know, if you want to read a review elsewhere, if, you, if I'm not telling you enough about it. But there's some great ones there, so I recommend those ones. Um, We've got, we, the, we've got, I gather we're getting some, uh, if you're a jigsaw person, we're getting some tank ones in, but if you like, big jigsaw, that one's aeroplanes, we've got one there, warships as well, so if you're um, one of those jigsaw puzzle people, um, I, have to, I have to show this one, which of course you won't be able to see or do, I can't get it to move, but do you remember when you used to have those pictures that you move, you tilt up and down, it looks like it's moving? You can get your Tiger 131 on one of those ones as well, so that will keep you occupied in those boring lessons at home or the office meetings or whatever it is. I know you're all TOG fans out there, so there's your uh, Fridge Magnet TOG. Um, TOG, the old gang. It was the first World War guys who were brought back to design a tank in World War II. That's what TOG stands for, so um, you can get your Fridge Magnet. There's um, I'm gonna have a quick slurp of my, um, before the sun goes down as well. purely medicinal. Don't forget, thank you as well. We had a major general sent me an email saying he'd managed to get his, I think it was his granddaughter or his niece, um, to hint, hint, buy him some, and she did. So well done, thank you, major general. And uh, so your tank socks, um, don't go out without them. And I think as well, and don't forget, we've still got the 88 millimeter, and as this one is, uh, the 17 pounder rounds there. So there's still plenty of other things. And of course, here behind me, if you're interested in, that's the Royal Tank Regiment with the Queen's Crown. How do you tell King's Crown and Queen's Crown? This was the imp simple one. So Queen's Crown, think of them, I oh, always think of them as breasts, slightly rounded that way. That means that the Queen is on the throne when it's put into, um, when it's being produced as it were. A King's Crown has a dome, a single dome over the top and that means there's a king on the throne. So there's a Royal Tank Regiment, Queen's Crown on the top, and their famous Fear Nought with the First World War tank on. So you can get yourself a tank, uh, Royal Tank Regiment. We are, of course, the Tank Museum is the Royal Tank Regiment's Regimental Museum, as well as the Royal Armoured Corps Museum, which is the bigger corps that encompasses the other regiments that fight in tanks. And you can get your Challenger cap as well. So. Um, those of you, I always say it, thank you if you have bought stuff from us. Thank you for your nice comments supporting us. Um, obviously, we are gearing up now to reopen the museum. Look on the website. We'll keep you informed there of what's going on, how you can come and visit, what, what we will be opening and what we can't open yet, etc. All the different variations there. So do look at that on the website. Um, and if you do have an opportunity, I know not everyone can, thanks for the nice words and everything, but do if you can buy something from our shop. That's really good for us to help her keeping us going. And Finn, come around here. Yes, I know you've had a lovely time of it, haven't you? Sorry. Come here a moment, Finn. Come around here and say goodbye. Come here. He's such a bad dog when he talks. Come here. He's, a bit, he's just interested. Come up here. No, no, you're not in. Come here and say goodbye. So anyway, oh, sit. Finn is, um, there we go. Finn says goodbye as well. So bye-bye. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel. And, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop, uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organization, and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.